Father Richard Chipola is our third and final speaker this evening. And truly have we kept the best wine for last, as is said in the Gospels. A convert from Anglicanism and an Oxford graduate, Father Chipola is a Catholic priest, liturgist, and writer. He is an administrator for the blog Rorate Chaley and frequently publishes his commentary there. He was pastor of St. Mary's in Norwalk, Connecticut until 2018. Under his tenure, the parish, I'm going to be doing some editorial fiddling here because I'm going to, when you hear this next sentence, under his tenure, the parish became a bastion for the finest liturgical practice, one of two parishes, including mine, uh, for the finest liturgical practice in potentially the country. He is the chaplain for the Society of St. Hugh of Cluny, the excellent organization which facilitates and promotes the traditional mass and events such as these throughout the East Coast. Well beloved by his altar boys and spiritual sons, Father Chipola has inspired many vocations throughout his priesthood. It is honor an honor to have him here with us today. Father Chipola. Rage. Gotta sing the rage of Pelus' son Achilles. Murderous doom that cost the Achaeans countless losses, hurtling down to the house of death so many sturdy souls. Great fighter souls, but may their bodies carry in. Feast for the dogs and birds. And so begins in the English translation by Robert Fagels. One of the seminal epic poems of Western civilization, the Iliad. The first book is called The Rage of Achilles. Achilles, the, the son of a goddess, fierce, the ultimate war hero, and, and yet in Fagel's words, in his, in his introduction to the Iliad, imprisoned in a godlike, lonely, heroic fury from which all the rest of the world is excluded. Achilles, the hero, sits out most of the Iliad in rage against Agamemnon for taking his, his concubine, Briseis. And then he returns to action, so to speak, only when his friend Patroclus, whom he loves so deeply, Achilles sits out most of the Iliad and he returns to action, so to speak, only when his friend Patroclus, whom he loves so deeply, is killed and then despoiled by the Trojan Hector. And it is then that Achilles becomes the killing machine. Not so much for the cause of the Greeks against the Trojans, but rather because of his rage against Hector, a hero in his own right, for, for killing and despoiling Patroclus. And in that terrible scene that we all know so well, he kills Hector and then he drags his body around the walls of Troy three times in uncontrollable fury. He rises as a hero to avenge the death of, 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 his, be, of his beloved Patroclus. And, he, and he's godlike in his single-mindedness to punish at all costs the one and also those who have taken away someone that he loved so deeply. Heroism as single-mindedness, as physical prowess in war, as exhibiting passionate emotion, and also heroism, ironically, as knowing as well that one is doomed to death by the botched attempt of a god to make him immortal. Arma Wurunque Kano. So begins the Aeneid, Virgil's epic poem about the trials and tribulations of the founding of Rome by Aeneas, a fugitive from Troy who, who witnessed the destruction of that great city. I sing of arms and the man. I think of war and the man. The man who was the hero that makes possible not only the founding of Rome, but, but 
who Virgil makes the personification of the ideal of Roman civilization. One sees clearly at the start that this hero Aeneas is, is quite different from Achilles. We first see Aeneas, or meet Aeneas, not in a sulking rage in his tent, refusing to fight for, for the Greeks. We first meet Aeneas on a ship in a terrible storm, a storm whipped up by the orders of Juno, the goddess queen who fears the founding of Rome and does everything that she can do to stop it. The first speech of, of this hero in the translation by Robert Fitzgerald, as the hurricane is threatening the lives of everyone on board ship. Aeneas on the instant felt his knees go numb and slack and stressed both hands to heaven groaning out, triply luckily all you men to whom death came before your father's eyes below the wall of Troy. Bravest Danian, Diomedes, why could I not go down when you had wounded me and lose my life on Ilium's battlefield. This hero is not Achilles. He's terribly frightened. And he wishes that he had died defending Troy instead of dying of drowning at sea. Not a good introduction to a hero. The hero who would lay the foundation of the founding of Rome and the Roman civilization that left its mark even after its fall on the way to that Western civilization that developed totally impregnated with, with the Christian faith. Aeneas is the first modern hero. That is, the hero is flawed, son of a goddess, but very human indeed, with glaring faults that include a forgetting of who he was and what was his calling. That forgetfulness defines in many ways Western man through history, which deliberate forgetfulness is a mark of modern and also post-modern man. Modern man deliberately forgot his roots. Postmodern man has almost no clue of what are, what are his roots. Aeneas forgets his calling to found Rome when confronted with, with the very special woman that is Dido. Dido as a real and persuasive temptation, a great woman. For Aeneas was very real and also perfectly understandable. It, it was a temptation to become settled down and to become ordinary with an extraordinary woman. And it took a hair-raising visit from Mercury, from Jupiter, to jolt Aeneas to remember his destiny. Virgil describes Aeneas many times by the use of the adjective pius. This adjective becomes almost a part of his name, pius Aeneas. This adjective cannot be translated by the English adjective pious, especially in a time when piety is not seen as something entirely positive, even in the Catholic Church. Pius means something quite clear to Virgil. Devotion and allegiance to the gods, to one's family, and to one's country, patria. Aeneas is obviously obvious love for his comrades, his constant taking on the burden of his calling, and it is a burden, his appreciation 
of the lacrime redo, the tears of things that lie at the very heart of the human experience. His face of optimism and hope that he always presents to his comrades when he weeps inside and is fearful. His positive self-forgetting within his special vocation. This is Pius Aeneas. Even when in the last books of the Aeneid, Aeneas becomes a fighting machine, something, something like Achilles, his pietas is not lost. To see that pietas in marble, one must go to the Galleria Borghese in Rome and to see one of the earliest of Bernini's sculptures that depicts Aeneas fleeing the destruction of Troy, carrying his aged father Anchises on his back, and his father carrying, holding the household gods. Aeneas holding the hand of his little son, Eulus. As they go forth from burning Troy, to the unknown that is known as his destiny. I would submit, willingly accepting the, the arrows of historicists and current despisers of Western culture, that Roman pietas was transformed into Catholic pietas, not as a merely human development, but rather as a result of the, of the thunderclap of the incarnation that transcended and fulfilled not merely the longing of the Jews, but also the dogged and, if also unclear and also flawed, longing of the Roman understanding, despite its warping to the years of the empire of Pietas love of God, love of family, and love of one's country, the latter understood as something that transcends mere nationalism. One either believes that the, inca that the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ, in our time and space, radically changed the nature of things, changed time and space itself in relationship to human beings, such that after the incarnation, time is no longer linear, but spherical, with the incarnation at its center, either one believes that or not. If not, Christianity is mere religion, one religion among many, and in the end, a currently common opinion in Rome, as we just heard. It makes no difference then what one believes, because the God who is the Wizard of Oz has many tracks on his choo-choo train, and everyone ends up in the same wonderful place that is a projection of each individual's picture of happiness. But against this false and facile and foolish version of Christianity, they're the saints, the Christian heroes who are products of the Big Bang of the Incarnation. The, the Christian heroes are always a problem for those who would reduce Christianity to mere moralism, to being kind and good and to allow others to be kind and good in their own way without any reference to faith or to belief. The Latin word virtus is the origin of the English word virtue. Once a powerful word in the English language, virtue as a word now appears only in Tony BBC remakes of Jane Austen novels, or in homework assignments for Catholic boys and girls, studying for the test that will allow them to be confirmed. Imagine a sacrament, depending on passing a test. 
The first meaning in Latin of virtus is the obvious one. The quality of the man hero, the vir. The secondary meanings are strength, courage, bravery, and in the Christian era, virtue. And the saints remind us that one cannot have virtue in the deepest sense without being strong, without having courage, without being a hero. And, and here comes the pedantry of the Latin teacher. The word virtus in Latin is feminine. Those of us who celebrate the traditional mass, at the heart of our priesthood, know deeply the virtus of, of Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all the saints. The quality of virtus transcends both sex and gender. Speaking of gender, I used to tell my Latin students in the classroom when the whole question of the, of the deliberate misuse of the word gender in our culture came up in class. I always said to them, nouns have gender, people have sex. If your parents had gender and not sex, you would not be here today. <laughs> I shall briefly offer three, three Christians as examples of a Christian hero. One must understand essentially that what sets them apart from heroes in, in general is that the heart of their heroism is, an, is not an idea, it's not an ideal, but rather a person. And this person is Jesus Christ born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and on the third day rose from the dead. What makes the Christian hero is not merely pietas, or bravery, or a shining example of virtue, which they all have. But what makes the Christian hero is the person of Jesus Christ, and the imitation of him. The first is St. Paul. For me, almost the very identification of the Christian hero. It is perhaps unfair to offer him as an example because he is so singular in so many ways. Who also was knocked of his horse as he, a Pharisee, was traveling to persecute Christians, knocked off in such a dramatic way that leaves nothing to the imagination, especially as painted by, by Caravaggio and seen in Santa Maria del Popolo in Rome. St. Paul, like all Christian heroes, is not perfect. He's flawed. His letters betray his disappointment and his frustration with those in the churches to whom he writes and which he visits who, who, who just don't understand what it means to be a disciple of Christ and what this means for one's life. Paul is sensitive about his own calling as an apostle. Unlike Peter, whom, whom Jesus made the rock in his living presence, with all that means and with all that does not mean, Paul is called late in time and never knew Jesus as he walked this earth. And that causes conflict for him in his own self-understanding and certainly in his relationship with Peter. But when one reads Paul's letters, it is absolutely clear that he understands that the person of Jesus Christ is the heart of his existence and that he believes passionately and certainly that Christ is the savior of the world, not merely of Jewish converts, but the whole world. 
and his faith drives his missionary journeys replete with shipwrecks and beatings and, 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 and imprisonment. And the writings of his letters to the various churches throughout, throughout the Roman Empire, without which there would be bold statement coming, without which there would be no Christianity. And it is Paul who understands that the ultimate imitation of Christ in, in the world is to die for Christ. And it is this imitatio Christi that fuels his heroism and makes him such a wonderful Christian hero. The second is Saint Ignatius of Antioch. I first met this Christian hero in the Bodleian Library at, at Oxford University. I was doing my doctoral thesis on, on the history and development of the doctrine of transubstantiation in the church. So I knew I had to read Ignatius' letter to the Romans. My, my Greek was not great. And I remember sitting there in the dreary English damp cold, because the English always keep the windows open, even in the winter, <laughs> struggling through the text. And then I came upon this passage. I write to the churches and impress on them all that I shall willingly die for God unless you hinder me. I beseech of you not to show an unseasonable goodwill towards me. Allow me to become food for the wild beasts through whose instrumentality it will be granted me to obtain to God. I'm the weed of God. And let me be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts that I may be found the, the pure bread of Christ. Then shall I truly be a disciple of Christ when the world shall not so much see so much as my body, and treat Christ for me that by these instruments I may be found a sacrifice to God. I do not, as Peter and Paul, issue commandments unto you. They were apostles. I am but a condemned man. They were free, while I am e even until now a servant. But when I suffer, I shall be the freed man of Jesus and shall rise again emancipated in him. And now being a prisoner, I learn not to desire anything worldly or vain. All the pleasures of the world and all the kingdoms of this earth shall profit me nothing. It is better for me to die on behalf of Jesus Christ than to reign over all the ends of the earth. I stopped reading. Ignatius's words, his faith in the person of Jesus Christ and his faith in the real presence of this person in the Eucharist stopped me cold. And in, and in retrospect, and I think about this often, this was an important event one of the important events that led me to the Catholic Church. But not only his belief in the second century, in the r real presence, but his understanding that the ultimate imitatio Christi is martyrdom made me understand for the first time the essence of the Christian hero, the imitation of the ultimate self-giving of the Son of God, martyrdom as the ultimate imitatio Christi. Now, it is certainly true that many men and women th th through the past two millennia have had the, imita the, I the imitatio Christi at the very center of their lives and, and have imitated Christ in the way in which they lived their lives, which is this subordination of the self by the act of self-giving love. 
but it is martyrdom for the sake of Christ that is the ultimate crown. Again, it's not only that desire for martyrdom. The Christian desire for martyrdom is driven by love, a love for those to whom Ignatius is writing all those letters on his way to Rome, those who lived in fear of persecution every day, and his own love for his own flock in Antioch as their bishop, and, and his constant concern for all those living in cities on his way to Rome. The foundation of his concern, his loving concern, is the person of Jesus Christ whom he knows and therefore loves. The third is Joan of Arc. Her presence in my life is somewhat recent. Some years ago, while rushing through the later European paintings in the, in the Metropolitan Museum of, of Art here in Manhattan, on my way to some painting that I was told is very important to the Met Collection, I walked by a painting <laughs> by an artist of the later 19th century French. I never heard of this guy. I stopped and I looked and was mesmerized. The painting is quite strange and quite rightly because Joan hearing the voices of the three saints calling her to her peculiar mission is strange. The intensity of her listening face and the mysterious crudity of the painting of the three saints, and the almost alarming clarity of her surroundings. I stood there and I said to myself, why don't I know this woman? I knew about her vaguely from, from history books, strange young woman dressed up in armor like a man and led an army to rid France of the English enemy and was burned at the stake in all. All these facts. I knew she was a saint, but only recognized as such by canonization as late as the second decade of the 20th century. I read about her from various sources, and then I hit upon her biography in novel form by Mark Twain. Mark Twain, one of the greatest skeptics of any religion. But Twain said that that was the best novel he ever wrote. And what Twain saw in her was the truth about Joan of Arc. He was able to detach from her particular situation, her, her, her system Laban, at a particular time and place, to see her as a true hero who transcended her time and place. And Twain knew, even if he did not understand, that what drove her to don her armor was not merely because she, she was the maid of, maid of, of, of Lorraine, who heard these voices of the saints, but because of her Catholic faith that exemplified itself in her pietas, part of which was love of her country and of her country's Catholic faith. The peasant girl who, who did what no man could do for years to lift the siege of Orléans and to go on to make it possible to have Charles, uh, Charles VII crowned as, as King of France and Rem. Truly this woman echoes the words of John of Austria's words to his men about to do battle with the Ottoman fleet off the coast of Greece at, at Lepanto. John of Austria said, there is no paradise for cowards. Joan of Arc was betrayed, betrayed by her countrymen, betrayed by her church. 
She was totally abandoned by those she fought for and in a horrendous mock trial led by a faithless bishop. She was stripped of the very heart of her singular and in some ways incomprehensible quest. And she was burnt at the stake in a public square in a wall. One wonders, despite her canonization 500 years after her death, what the irony of Joan's martyrdom was ever understood by the church? Probably not, and certainly not now. For she, as so many other Christian heroes, has faded into that place where the names of saints are now mere names. Nomina nuda, verba nuda. Shortly after the movie, The Graduate became a big hit in 1967. And the song from that film, M Mrs. Robinson, became a hit as well. Paul Simon happened to meet Joe DiMaggio in a restaurant. Who, and when Paul Simon went over to Joe DiMaggio and introduce himself, Joe DiMaggio got very testy. And he said to Simon, why did you write those words? Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? And Paul Simon, in his retelling of this meeting, was taken aback. He didn't know what to say. And he really could not answer. And that further refrain in the song, Jesus loves you more than you can know. Where did that come from? The 60s were that time of transition from modern to postmodern, a time of social upheaval, a time of challenging deeply the basic assumptions and the mores of a Western culture that was permeated by Christian faith. And sadly and ironically, that was exactly the time that the, that the Catholic Church decided to become modern. When the rest of the Western world was abandoning modernity. Now, it was not being abandoned for the sake of turning to the Catholic faith, to be sure, but rather for, for a post-modernity that has little interest in the modern world. That latter world formed, at least symbolically, by the so-called Enlightenment, and which crumbled under the onslaught of two terrible world wars. The tragedy associated with the Second Vatican Council is not the council itself. Because many ecumenical council, councils contributed very little to the ongoing faith of the church. Most of the councils contributed just what they had to. No more and no big deal about the council. The tragedy of the Second Vatican Council is not merely councilolatry, worship of the council, nor is adopting the false confidence of the revolutionaries who were convinced that they were ushering in a new world in which all you need is love. The real and deep tragedy of the council is its stillborn attempt to make Catholic worship modern, imposing forcibly on the whole Catholic Church, just like the Protestants did at the English Reformation. A liturgy that is redolent of, of a somewhat progressive looking but terribly sentimental sitcom of the 60s and 70s. That now has little relevance to contemporary man. 
and even less relevance to the worship of the church within the God-given tradition of the church. And whose bitter fruit is, is the fact that, at least in the Western world, an average of only 20% of Catholics attend Mass on a Sunday. And it's much worse than that in Europe. The Greek word doxa in, in classical Greek means common belief or popular opinion. Socrates famously rejected doxa as, as understood in this way as a basis of truth, nothing to do with truth. But many centuries later, the translators of the Septuagint translated the Hebrew word for glory, as in the glory of God, as doxa. And it is this word that permeates the entire New Testament with respect to the glory of God and not an and not insignificantly in the book of Revelation, that vision and handbook, so to speak, of the eternal worship of God in heaven. What this means is that one cannot separate true worship, how one worships God, from true doctrine, what is to be believed as true. True and good worship of of God brings forth and supports the truth of dogma. And this is certainly true in the development of doctrine, so wonderfully understood by John Henry Newman, who, who God willing, very soon will be a saint of the church. The form of worship, the liturgy, that departs from the, from the bond between the truth of doctrine and the truth of worship within that special Holy Spirit-led reality that we call Catholic tradition must in the end dissolve both worship in spirit and in truth and the very idea of orthodoxy as, as what, is to, what is to be believed. The heroes of the church, of the immediate and the near future, will be those Catholic men and women, lay first of all, and then priests, and then bishops, who will understand that the fruit of wrong worship is wrong theology and wrong living. A liturgy made up after the council by a committee called a concilium, some members of which openly despise the Roman Mass, and you can read this for yourself. At a certain time and at a certain place in the history of the church, a liturgical rite concocted on the basis of liturgical scholarship du jour and personal preferences, a liturgical rite that is a break with the tradition of the church cannot provide the spiritual nourishment that will enable Catholics in the future to be Christian heroes. And without Christian men and women as Christian heroes, the scandal and the wonder of the incarnation will no longer be known. Without Christian heroes, the centrality of the cross of Jesus Christ, which gives meaning to the suffering of the world, will be lost. Without Christian heroes, the reality of the promise of eternal life in Jesus Christ will be lost. But there are young people here those, those who organized this conference and young people in many other places who, who are coming to understand what it means to be a Catholic and, and so importantly, have, 
have come to that understanding because they have discovered the traditional Roman mass. And, and on that basis, they are willing to become Christian heroes, even if it means, and it will mean this, in that in some real way to walk the way of the cross, especially within a church whose leaders have deliberately forgotten what it means to be a Christian hero, and who seem hell-bent to make the Catholic Church into a form of Anglicanism, except without good taste. <laughs> Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? Our nation turns its lonely eyes to you. Woo woo woo. What's that you say, Mrs. Robinson? Jolting Joe has left and gone away. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Or this. Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O oh, clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from spiritual fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have restored the worship of God in every Catholic church in every land. Wonderful. Wonderful.